You are listening to Adventures in Sustainable Business with Jurgensen and Peterson. Join the adventurous exploration of sustainable business. Okay. In this special episode of Adventures in Sustainable Business, Svainong, we are going to do uh, one of the most important parts of our work and and, uh, one of the things about our work that we like the most, which is talk to students. Uh, I would say that most of the good questions and sort of new ideas that we've gotten in our research and our teaching have in one way or another come from students either in our own courses or elsewhere. And in this uh, episode, we are going to um, explicitly get asked questions from students. We might in return ask some questions back. Uh, We are here for a conversation uh, that was initiated by two students at the University of Bergen. Uh, Ingeborg Grunning, who is a bachelor student in molecular <laughs> biology and geography. What did she say? Uh, yeah, let me she try was, again. She was a bachelor student in. She was a bachelor student at the University of Bergen. Oh, yeah. I think I said. <laughs> and Hanna Johansson, who is doing a master's in sustainability at the Department of Humanities at the University of, of Bergen, or Bergen to keep it consistent. Uh, both uh, of our guests are um, also have a, a different role at the university, which is uh, part of the reason why they're here. They are, in fact, coordinators for a new student-led course at the university called Sustainable Innovation. It's a course that is open for students uh, from from several levels uh, of, of studies and also across different uh, departments. Uh, and uh, the many of the questions that are, we will be discussing today have come from students in this course. Welcome to us, Hanna and Ingeborg. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so impressed, Lars Jakob, that you actually tried to say that, the, the name of that <laughs> country, or Ingeborg. Is it, is it possible to pronounce it? What is it? Molecular biology. Oh, that was perfect. Wow. Mm-hmm. I would have to spend one year of that bachelor program just to learn to say it. I needed three years. <laughs> and I wouldn't dare to ask you what you really are studying. No, please don't. No. <laughs> but still, you're now having this course in uh, sustainable innovation, as uh, Lars Jakob uh, described. And, and it's a student-led uh, course where you are the coordinator. Yes. And uh, that's a sustainable innovation in itself. Tell us a little about the, the course. Yeah, should I take it away? <laughs> take it away and just nod to me. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, it's basically that we are hired to make up this whole course. So we have coordinated both the sessions uh, and we have also found cases for the students to work on. So throughout the course, the students are divided into groups and they are working on cases. And they are trying to innovate something for companies or organizations, uh, mainly based in uh, Bergen. Um, so yeah. Can you uh, tell us uh, some examples? What kind of cases have you been working on? Yeah, so this year we have a pretty broad range mm-hmm. of courses, uh, cases. Um, so we have uh, Summon, which is uh, you know the the student organization. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess like the students listening know what Summon is. Uh, so they are trying to um, to find uh, food labeling in their canteens. Mm. So like a certification for students to know what is more sustainable, I guess. Uh, that's one of them. Do you want to? Yeah, we have one with Green Pesto. And they want to kind of find a way to make them recycling kind of at festivals more green. And the students there have actually come up with a pretty cool idea. So uh, we're looking forward to hear that. And you actually lead one of the cases, Anna. Yeah, yeah, I have like uh, two hats in, the, <laughs> in this course. Because uh, I also work for an organization called SMB Norge, or SME Norway, uh, which is an uh, organization for small and uh, middle range businesses. Uh, so we also have a case uh, that is about uh, lowering the threshold for uh, small and middle range businesses to um, to get on with the green shift. Um, so yeah, that's great. That's mm-hmm. great. And, and the students in this course, they are from various educational programs. Yeah, and you meet from all over, all over the place, <laughs> and they meet in this course and they work with cases. And then you uh, have also invited uh, lecturers from from other universities and also practitioners into the course or. 
Mm. Yeah, so uh, we've done it a bit different from a regular course, I guess. Uh, that's been a part of being a student coordinator, you know, like trying to think new about what a course in a university can be. Uh, so we mostly have, uh, we've had a lot of panel debates. Mm. Uh, and workshops and in the panels we've invited both um, professors uh, from UIB but also uh, and of our, yeah. Norwegian School of Economics, Norwegian okay. School of Economics. Um, and uh, also from the municipality uh, with different topics related to sustainable innovation. So I think like the panel discussion gives the students an opportunity to participate in another way than a regular lecture. So we have like the small presentations at first and then the students can ask questions. So there are at least two innovations in, in one here. So so one innovation is this idea of the, the course being student-led, which I think is, is an excellent way of thinking alternatively about, in some sense, the organization and governance of the course, uh, who comes up with the ideas, who makes the choices and leads, uh, you know, leads the whole thing. Uh, then there's this other innovation that we, we touched on, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into, which is that you bring together uh, people from the different uh, fields of study at the university. And we do this, of course, at, at, at our business school as well. But arguably, the, the, the path from finance to strategy to marketing is probably shorter than the path from, you know, law to medicine to uh, mole molecular biology. <laughs> I just had to try it. <laughs> it, it probably was, uh, wasn't even right. But my, my point is, you know, there's something, you know, beautiful and very, you know, I think core to the, the idea of the university to bring together people with different backgrounds, different kinds of, of competence uh, and make them solve problems together. At the same time, however, we know that that can be tricky. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, both both sides of that coin, both, you know, both what kinds of students are taking this course, what kinds of diverse backgrounds do they have? And what are your experiences with bringing them together in, a, in actual problem solving in the classroom? That's a good question. We, uh, I think the students are mostly from like social sciences, but we have a couple of students from molecular biology <laughs> <laughs> and some other so, um, nature sciences. And I think some, yeah, some other students as well. And I think they really like to work in this interdisciplinary groups. Cause you know, as a, um, molecular biologist I'm used to like just focus on uh, molecules and proteins but like trying to get that bigger picture on sustainability I think the students really like that and they learn a lot from each other yeah definitely and I think also this interdisciplinary has become such you know it's talked about everywhere you know like that's how we're going to make the big like, big changes and uh but how do you actually do this in practice it's it's quite hard uh mm -hmm. I think both to, to make it happen, but also the challenges and like, well, when you come from natural sciences, you have maybe a very different way to approach a problem than coming from social science. Mm -hmm. So I think also in some groups you see you know, that just understanding the problem in the same way is, uh, is challenging. Mm -hmm. and that's perhaps easier for our students because we, in our course and in sustainable business models, for instance, we, we take the standpoint of a, of a company. So we look at the world from the standpoint of a company and we look at the world in a way there that uh, the whole world is just a bunch of business models working or not working together. Mm. But you come from, uh, or, or you and your follow, fellow students come from, from different perspectives. And then you have to see the world with those glasses on and then mm -hmm. work on sustainable innovation here, which requires work on the governmental level, on the business level and individual level. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's, uh, and there's, there's quite large problems to be fixed. Uh, so are, are they kind of overwhelmed by this or how's the spirit in the, in, in the group so far? I think they were a bit overwhelmed mm -hmm. beginning the course, but yesterday actually we had a workshop on prototyping. We're pretty, uh, late in the course now, they are finished in yeah in the end of March, and I think this pro uh, prototyping workshop where they got to really feel the problem and sit there with the like uh, cardboard and scissors and glue really got the spirits up, and they got to see their prototype and their innovation yeah become real. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the problem definition is probably the the most difficult because you have this like very broad problem and you see in the beginning you have like a problem definition of maybe actually three different problems because you try to solve everything at once and then you have to you know like towards the end of the course like narrow it down and actually focus on one like 
maybe it's a small thing, but in the big picture, like it's uh, it's important. And I think that that is is, is such a um, central characteristic to so many of the problems that I would consider as falling under the umbrella of sustainable innovation, is that they have so many you know so many related challenges that need to be solved by using different kinds of toolboxes. So let's say you want to stimulate uh, electrical vehicles in a market. Well, yeah, first of all, you need the technology to work. <laughs> that is a, a first. Um, then perhaps you would like to pull some policy levers. You know, you want to subsidize it. You want to have some sort of tax break or whatever. Um, then there's the psychological dimension. Will will this guy trust that the uh, car will won't break yeah, down? And why always you? Will this guy trust? <laughs> me? Uh, you, but you get my point that there there will always be this sort of mix of of technological challenges of, of you know policy and then sort of uh, institutional challenges uh, it could be price related challenges and, and the sort of individual psychology social psychology challenges and and all of those things put together i think a university is really uh, uniquely set up for bringing together people with those diverse backgrounds and, and sit down together and look look at the electrical car from those different uh, vantage points to be concrete mm -hmm. But, but again, in, in, in my head, working with sustainable innovation, I always then think about the, the company. But do you take the company standpoint here or do you work from the, from the governmental side? You had some cases that were all companies in, in mm -hmm. different ways. But when you work with it, the readings you have on the course and the processes and the prototyping, is it, uh, is it then business model design or, or how do you work with this? Yes, yeah, so we work with uh, like the method that we use in the course is design thinking. Uh, so I guess it's, yeah, like innovation methods. So I will say that it's because design thinking is like a, a person uh, focused uh, method. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's it's all about the case in like, who are you inventing for? So I guess it can be the company or it can be the user or it can be the government. We have also a case from Bergen municipality, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, I think it's, uh, yeah. It's kind of up to the students, yeah. how they want to approach the problem. Yeah. And now at the end of the course, or almost uh, halfway into the course, you, you had a session and, and, and discussed with your fellow students, uh, what do they want to know? Uh, you have some questions for us, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And we will try to answer. Uh... Sveinung will do the hard ones and I'll, <laughs> I'll take the, the, the cherry picked ones. Yeah, so I guess where we are now in the course, when they have like actually started, they have something a bit more concrete. Now it's uh, also about discussion, what is sustainable, mm -hmm. which is hard, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is also something we try to incorporate into this uh, this course. It's not just about innovating something, but how, like, how do we know that it's sustainable? Uh, so maybe you can talk a bit about that. Uh, I mean, it's not a very uh, broad question. But, uh, <laughs> It is a very, that is a very good question. And I, we recently, um, in a previous episode in this um, podcast series, uh, we um, were visited by Nancy Bocken, one of the leading researchers in the world on uh, what is often referred to as sustainable business models. And she has written a paper uh, by that name, which is widely cited uh, thousands of times uh, for, for close to a decade now. But she recently wrote a new paper called Unsustainable Business Models, where she tries to take the other angle going in you know what is it that characterizes a company or a business model that is not sustainable what are those patterns that we sort of need to break uh, in different industries whether you know, we're talking about retail or we're talking about the clothing industry or transportation or whatever it might um, it might be uh, and towards the end of that uh, conversation we uh, after having talked about sort of the journey from from relatively unsustainable to more sustainable business models we were talking about exactly this challenge and she was basically pointing this out as one of the big questions that we need to tackle right now. Because I think most people will, will recognize this thing that if we think about sort of the early days of, of, of the conversation about sustainable business, and when I say early, I mean in recent times, um, there were a lot of, of sustainability claims, you know, this this gene is made from, these genes are made from recycled materials or this, this uh, this table is sustainable, and it was never or, or hardly ever uh, substantiated in any way what that meant. 
Uh, and you, you also had those claims at the level of companies. They were talking about, you know, we are going green, we are going from non-renewable fuels to, to renewable uh, sources of energy. But what percentage, you know, how much? How much of Equinor is now uh, renewable, for instance? Uh, and I think those questions, those harder questions have started being asked. And I think part of the reason um, is that the finance industry has started started <laughs> getting interested in this. They want to know if they invest in uh, Orkla or Coop or Equinor or Telenor, they want to understand, well, what are the risks associated with the CO2 emissions of these companies? What are the risks associated with uh, potential human rights violations in their supply chains? So they start asking for concrete numbers. Uh, and I think we are now in the middle of a, call it a revolution, but at least a very strong evolution from a world where it was good enough to say, you know, now we're making a lot of recycled clothes or we're, you know, an increasing part of our fleet of cars in this transportation company is electrical. But we're now going into a phase where, you know, you need to be much more precise about those numbers and you're benchmarked against what others do. Uh, and you're seeing in some sense, I think, a race between companies that are competing to, you know, recycle the, the highest amount of materials from discarded products. They're trying to reduce energy usage, usage from fossil fuels to zero the quickest. They want to move from non-recyclable to recyclable um, packaging, for instance, if, you're, if you have a product that is packaged. And they are forced to make these things very, very concrete. Uh, and uh, and I think that is is the biggest transition. I'm sure, so I know you have several things to add on here. But I think we're we're very much in a transition now, where you're asked to back up your claims about how sustainable you are, if if you claim to be sustainable, uh, with actual numbers on things like you know the percentage of of uh, reduced emissions, the reduced water waste, and agricultural production. You know whatever the industry might be, we're asked to back up those claims. Absolutely, and I think that's the, the point. It's it's uh, it it depends what is sustainable was, was the question. It really depends on the on the company and what is the current footprints of this uh, company. And uh, when we work with financial analysis, for instance, sitting with companies, as Lars Jakob describes here, analyzing them, uh, trying to evaluate the risks of the company, the value of the, uh, the, the company, they want numbers now. And it used to be these glossy reports with, with children, people on bikes, and, and, you know, it looks like, this, you know, like... Uh, Scouts, all companies, sort of like uh, look like uh, you know some 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 working like uh, with uh, only with sustainability. Uh, when but when you look into the core and, and these financial analysis, they look into the core of the company. They look at the uh, look at the at the numbers and the economic numbers, but also numbers on the other things here. And and that that, that work that needs to be done in each and every company, as you also do with the cases. What are the externalities what are the negative effects of this company what are the positive effects of this company in the beginning and and, and working as you do in, in the course with design thinking and defining the problem you use that a couple of times what is the problem really here for whom um, and then moving from understanding and then exploring new opportunities testing them doing the pilots as you said and then going and saying okay we're ready now to reorganize this company for for a new future and then the reports has to come uh, and in the early days, not many years ago, you could write these glossy reports uh, about meta things. We are good for the future, you know. But now you have to show that in your water usage, if you produce clothes, uh, your climate emissions, if you produce wine and you transport wine from one area of the world to, to another, how, uh, the bottles are extremely important. How heavy are these bottles? Is it another way of, uh, of, of uh, transporting uh, bottles? Uh, what can we do with the bottles afterwards? What about those people who are drinking it? Uh, yes, there are some positive effects of, of uh, alcohol, some would argue, but there are lots of negative effects uh, as well. And as a company then in that industry, well, you have to have to show that. You have to know that and you have to show from year to year to year and, and try them to track. And it's quite difficult for a company, beer producing company, not beer, but beer, beer producing company, <laughs> uh, to, to knock on every door and see, 
are there underage people drinking here or are you drinking too much? Uh, so how to deal with that? And it's not easy. So the, the question, what is sustainable? Yes, well, it depends. It depends on the company and, uh, and um, it, uh, it's, it's not easy. And I'm going to add one last thing to this big and very, very, <laughs> very interesting and important question, which is that, and I think Svaidung touches on this at the very end, uh, you might make efforts to become sustainable more sustainable along one dimension. We see companies doing this all the time, but sometimes that can have negative effects along some other indicator of sustainability. And we, we have um, an executive student in our executive program who is working for one of the biggest um, industrial firms in Norway. She's working with sustainability in that company. And she she brought to one of our, our sessions with the executive program, this, this big, like almost like a poster, uh, which was a graph where you had uh, climate effects on the one side of the graph and, and biodiversity effects on the other. And then there were sort of lines going between here showing how these efforts that we could make to improve climate related outcomes might have these other negative side effects for for uh, biodiversity related outcomes. And we were talking to, to a climate scientist, in fact, on our, uh, on our Norwegian podcast series yesterday about the same thing how, for instance, in renewables, and you, you, you know uh, uh, as much and perhaps more about us uh, when it comes to these kinds of, of, of biodiversity related questions that, you know, uh, for many of the renewable industries, yes, you, you, can, you can reduce CO2 emissions by moving in that direction, but then there are these other biodiversity problems that arise when you try to uh, generate energy uh, using those source, sources, whether water power or, or wind power or whatever it might be. So, so I think that paradox as well makes it tricky to say, okay, so there's an activity over here, it's green. There's an activity over here that, that is brown. Well, most of the time it's, it's a sliding scale somewhere in between the two. As you focus on now, it's kind of the environmental focus on sustainability. But yeah, you can kind of divide sustainability into like the environmental and social and economic point of view. And I think our students don't really know a lot about the economic mm. point of view. Mm. And you guys are experts <laughs> <laughs> on that side. Perhaps you could say a bit about that. How do you know that something is economic sustainable? Mm. Mm. And uh, is it economic sustainable for the company or is it economic sustainable for all of society? Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and from a business point of view, we know a lot about profits, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> selling things expensive and making them cheap you know? <laughs> <laughs> and selling a lot, <laughs> then, then, you know, then, then the numbers uh, become blue uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom line. Uh, so, so, and, and for a sustainable innovation, then if you want to become more circular, for instance, and, and, and reuse waste or find ways of repairing, uh, uh, stuff for for people or or you know there's so many things that could be do, be done uh, at the same time then you need if, if you're going to be profitable for a company well then you need the customers to to change behavior well i used to have my own car uh, but uh, i see that i i may have a subscription on the car uh, instead and uh, and uh, ideally it will be electrical and ideally i will use the car less than i did before you know, at, and, and for many companies then to, to make a profit uh, out of that, uh, how many subscriptions does people really want to have? Uh, does it really matter for a consumer if that book is made of uh, virgin, uh, you know, paper that's uh, new or if it's recycled? Uh, does it really matter? Does it really matter? Does it really matter? So it is difficult for a company then to, to change their own behavior, to change their own value chain. And, and uh, I was just talking about wine and, and beer and alcohol. Um, in one way, you need to sell a lot. And in another way, you shouldn't sell that much, you know, because there will be health issues and there will be pollution issues and you use, use too much water. And, and, you know, there's so many problems involved. So it is difficult for a company then to change. It can be difficult to change uh, into a, a sustainable business model, which is profitable. At the same time, we must also remember that sustainability and the economic part of it is not only the economy for the company, it's, it's the economy for the whole society. And that makes it even more difficult. And it makes it also necessary to think about the relationships between those two, because the individual companies 
financial sustainability, if you will. There's also a function of the financial or economic sustainability, one might say, at the societal level, of the societies and markets in which they operate. So if you think about the SDGs, for instance, the Sustainable Development Goals, you have uh, goals like, of course, number eight, decent work and economic growth. So it's, in some sense, easier perhaps and better to be a company in a growing economy. <laughs> so you, you want the economy to, to, to grow. Uh, you want it to grow in a sustainable way, but you, you want it to grow so that you can thrive as an individual firm in that industry uh, and in that market. But in addition, if you think about goal number nine, which is industry innovation and infrastructure, that one is, I think, particularly important for what we're talking about now, because Again, we can think about what happens at the level of one company, but companies are part of clusters. They're part of industries and they're influenced by what other firms do. They're influenced by this important word infrastructure. And there are so many things that fall into that. So uh, think about uh, something like taxes, for instance, that are used uh, in part to improve parts of society that companies rely on. It can be something as simple as you know roads and bridges that transportation companies rely on in order to transport efficiently uh, but it can be all sorts of other things think about you know transitions from uh, 3g to 4g to 5g uh, technologies that that help companies that go digital to to do things that they couldn't do before and if we sort of leave that aspect out of the picture then we're we're losing something important so so you know part of 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 talking economic sustainability is not just thinking about, you know, it's often said, and I think it is true, that to make companies' sustainable business models truly sustainable, they also need to be profitable. Because if they're not profitable, these companies will start doing something else than, you know, selling clean technologies or, or you know, uh, circular models or, or whatever. But we also need to think about that level above. How does the society and community in which the company operates uh, how does that function so that companies can thrive within those settings? It's like uh, former President Obama said, uh, you didn't build that. And by that, he was talking to, to companies in the U.S. And he, what he was saying was, yes, you built what you built, but you built it on the shoulders of a society that offers you uh, highly competent labor coming out of our universities. Uh, we offer you roads. We offer you digital technologies. And all of this stuff is paid for by everyone. And you wouldn't be able to thrive as a company if that infrastructure wasn't in place. So I think we really need to think about, like Swainung is saying, the, the economic and financial dimensions of sustainability as being really two part, company level and society level. And those two are also interrelated. In yes, but let's talk a little bit more about the company level, uh, Lars Jakob, because I simply oversimplified it. I said like the, the income and the costs and, and, and selling more. And that's the customer side of it. And uh, I think it's important then for your students and, and, and all of you who are listening on this uh, podcast, um, you, you said the problem definition phase. And we start out that phase from a company perspective, trying them to understand what is the current business model of this company. What does it sell to whom in what way? How does it make money out of it today? Uh, and then we, we discuss the, the environmental part and the social part, these externalities and negative outcomes uh, for, for, like, uh, for, from the company's operations. And then we also, of course, discuss changes in, in regulations, changes in technology. Um, and, and companies, they need to, to change their business models all the time. Uh, new customers, new products, new services, new ways of delivering them, new partnerships, um, and new ways of, of making an income. And, and one one important, and some would argue that the most important is, is of course, the customer, the transaction uh, with with the customer uh, over time, and and uh, to to increase profits. Then, well, you need to find ways of increasing the income or decreasing the costs in the short run. In the longer run, uh, you need to 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 find ways of of of, of dealing with reputation. So, investing in in uh, sustainability might improve your reputation out there. And in the long run, also, it might also decrease the risk uh, of the company, which are all important for uh, the, 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 the profits of the, of the company. But we have to remember uh, the different stakeholders here. You, as students now coming out of the university, going to, into, into working life, uh, how should uh, companies uh, behave in order to get hold of you and your peers? Uh, and and that's that's a battle, and that has perhaps nothing to do with the transaction with the with the customer, but getting hold of the best employees. 
and, and retaining them over time and, and having them willing to invest their time and their resources in a company, learn more and work for the company. That's extremely important for the profit of a company. And then it's a, another factor might be uh, the relation uh, with the governments. Are you kind of a good neighbor? Are you uh, uh, something that this society want to? Uh, is it a company that the society wants? Can it uh, give you access to to land in your municipality, maybe cheaper because you're a cornerstone uh, company for for uh, the society there? That might be helpful for for profits. Uh, and then of course it's the bank. If the bank um, looks at your numbers and your operations and say, well, there's a lot of risk here. There's a lot of risk involved. And okay, you can get a loan, but it will be, uh, it's gonna cost you a lot. Uh, or you have, you need investors and they look at you and, and maybe they want to go home to their family uh, or they have to, uh, you know, they have to, to uh, they have their reg regulations and they want to be a part of, uh, you know, they have to, to follow the, uh, the, 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 the lead of, of the EU taxonomy, for instance. They will have a green investments and they look at your company and say, well, um, we like it, we like you, but uh, this, is, uh, this is leaning towards the brown and you're not doing enough here. Um, so um, we will not be a source for capital for you, and which makes capital then capital more expensive for the company. So it's I think it's important for these students to see the relationship with the customer, which is extremely important. But you also have to do this uh, stakeholder analysis and see okay where are the stakeholders today? Uh, what is important for them? What are the material issues for us to deal with here? And then the next step is okay how can we take these material issues? It could be water usage, it could be uh, climate emissions, it could be social factors, and then try to integrate that into the core of the business in the future. At the same time, uh, attracting the best employees, being a good partner for, for governments, for NGOs, uh, being uh, a company that uh, influencers want to identify themselves with, uh, and, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's not an... You, you asked the question as we knew. <laughs> and as you hear, I think, when we, when we describe this, this is something that uh, all of us have to work with and we have to understand the, the the company the business model and the surrounding and surroundings and everything that is going on and then try to work with these innovations uh, within the company over time uh, to 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 become profitable at the at the company level as well I think it's uh, it's quite interesting to hear it from more of the the business uh, yeah. point of view because I think that's something that we maybe haven't touched that much on mm -hmm. in, in the course so far. Um, but I also kind of want to ask because uh, you were talking about this, you know, like it used to be this um, kind of strategies and reports that was quite fluffy. Uh, sustainability <laughs> has been kind of a communication tool, maybe more than anything. Uh, but like, how do we actually measure? Because that's it's pretty hard to put into numbers uh, what your emissions are or what. And maybe especially on, because you have some factors that are easier to put into numbers and some factors that are harder. So maybe you can reflect a bit on, you know, how do we measure and what, you know, what factors might be left out in that uh, process of trying to put things into numbers. This is a very good and, and important question. And, and Sleinung used the word in passing here. He said the material issues. Companies need to deal with material issues. And this is a it's actually a technical term from, from the field of accounting, actually, which, which means more or less important. And it's used when we talk about uh, sustainability in business, about the sort of process of prior, prioritization. So, you know, you would want a company like a fast fashion company, like H&M or something like that. You would want them to work with worker rights in, in the markets far away where they produce their, their clothes. Uh, if we're talking about a logistics company, we would want them to try to cut CO2. Right? So, so those are examples of how you... Uh, identify what we call material issues, those important indicators of the sustainability of, of the company. So, so that re uh, refers back to your first question. Um, and what, what then is the next challenge for the company is to say, well, now that we agree on what those three or five or 10 uh, issues are, it could be more than that as well. And a sustainability report can be hundreds of indicators. Then we need to ask ourselves, well, what is a good way to measure that? 
And for some things, you know, it can be it can be quite concrete. Uh, so it can be things like number of injuries in the workplace uh, or worse, number of deaths in the workplace. They are very concrete and e- quite easy to measure. An injury, of course, is a little bit gray area, but but most injuries in a production facility, you can identify when it happens. Right? Uh, that would be an example of a social indicator that is quite easy to, to, to identify when it happens. Then you have social indicators that are harder, you know, to what degree is a company, let's say an oil company working in the Middle East, uh, to, to what degree does that company contribute to the corruption culture in that, comp- in that country? And that can be harder to measure. And there can be indicators like, uh, have there been lawsuits against them? You know, have they, uh, are there any um, I don't know, NGO complaints or something? Uh, so, so those would be examples of social indicators that are very important. You want to know if companies are, are you know, engaging in corrupt activities uh, or turning a blind eye to corrupt activities in, 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 with their suppliers or, what, or whatever. But already there, you have much more sort of gray areas. Uh, then I think there's, there's probably something similar when it comes to, um, to environmental issues. Some things can be measured quite uh, in detail, whether tons of CO2 emissions or water waste in a production facility for beer. Carlsberg gives you very precise numbers for, for that. Uh, well, it's like eight in the morning. <laughs> and we and we actually use Carlsberg as a case for our business school students when they are introduced to this this field because they know the product so well of course uh, but uh, but also because Carlsberg has a very detailed uh, sustainability report that we use as, as a starting point and uh, another example of a social indicator that is quite poor as uh, Sinon referred to earlier is you know to what degree do they um, make efforts to make us you know not drink as heavily and then it's stuff like well it's written on the bottle that people who are pregnant shouldn't drink well is that really a good indicator of you know what does that really tell us right um, and then there will be environmental impacts also that are probably harder to measure. We were talking to a, a professor in law who works with the issue of microplastics in oceans. And she was saying, you know, when things end up in the ocean, it's hard to know exactly where they came from. It's hard to, you know, uh, how do we really measure uh, Coca-Cola's impact on microplastics in the ocean? Well, we can say something about their relative uh, share of produced plastics that go out into the world. And perhaps we could then say that the similar portion of microplastics in the ocean should be attributed to Coca-Cola. But of course, we can't really say that. We can't say that with certainty that this is the portion of microplastics in the ocean that we should attribute to Coca-Cola in their sustainability report. So all the time, you're trying to make those kinds of, you know, concrete, you know, operationalizations of of something that very often is is bigger and, and trickier to pin down, uh, but you know, and, and companies of course prefer to uh, to to be concrete. I was uh, talking to to um, a retail company the other day who are preparing their sustainability report, and, and one indicator that they use because they are a retail company, they have stores all over the cities of, of all of the country. Well, they use energy used per square meter of store space. It was very concrete, right? That is very comparable. So you can say that this Nilla store over here and this uh, Nurli store over here, they are quite similar in their energy footprint. Maybe not the most important footprint of, of that company, but it, but it's concrete, right? And, and I think often we have to live with that some of those kinds of footprints, we we can get that kind of very concrete information. Other times we need to think that, well... Coca-Cola's share of plastic production is approximately the same as their share of microplastics footprint, even though we can't really say that that's the case. So this also is very complex, I would say. Yeah, we have actually talked to a lot of students in the course, and they had a lot of questions. And Julie, one of our students, had a pretty big question for you guys. And she asks, is the green economy possible in a capitalistic market? Oh my God, that's uh, that's a great question. Because what is really the capitalistic system? Uh, you know, and, and I, I guess there are different kinds of capitalism, capitalistic <laughs> systems uh, around the world and within a country. And uh, I guess there's some ideological differences uh, between them as well. But if we can kind of take take some middle ground here of a capitalistic free market system with with the owners that I tried to de- describe earlier that invest their free money or money in a company expecting return. 
mostly on on, on their money, so they want a, a profit on that. Uh, there's some free. There's a free market where where you could buy and sell what you want, of course, within regulations. And as I said, these different systems around the world, the, the regulations are, are are different as well. Um, so, uh, yes, but, but just just hang on a second, Milos. But I, I will try because uh, I'm just trying to like what is like the, the basis here of a free capitalistic uh, economy versus a planned economy or a communist uh, society or economy where there's more plan and uh, you do not have the opportunity to invest in company and own own them in, in that way. That's kind of a, a two different systems. And again, as there will be many different points of, of, of them uh, as well. But if it's possible and to solve the, the problems that we are facing within kind of the mainstream capitalistic system here uh, i think the, the the easy way out is to say no because there are there need to be changes made to that system uh, a big problem here is is me and Lars Jakob, of course and, and you and all of us as customers because we are free then to, to choose what to buy when to buy it uh, what to do with it afterwards of course within regulations and we're free to invest in companies within the, within the country and outside of the country and and as individuals then we kind of form this uh, capitalistic system so the capitalistic system in many ways are us within some restrictions and if we don't change if we don't invest differently don't choose to work in in in, in the companies that uh, offers uh, sustainable solutions if we do not uh, choose then to to buy purchase more sustainable clothes uh, <laughs> and and everything well the sum of that will be uh, then the question will be no but at the same time there are so many things that are, are going on now so many changes that are made within that system on the individual level on the company level on on the governmental level and then the, the then the answer is yes i think it's possible but of course we have to change and i think i'm maybe more Positive, uh, meaning that I, I, I'm more. I see all the problems of the capitalist system that it drives. You know, it drives a consumption culture. It uh, it certainly drives like, like an uh, indiscriminate appetite for growth. There are so many things that the capitalist system does that we need to put the brakes on in some sense. And and some countries have capitalist systems that are more you know, effective in putting the brakes on that engine than others, of course. Um, I think, though, that, that a part of, of this conversation, because this is, of course, a very broad conversation, uh, you know, is green growth and, and, and green economy possible in a capitalist system? But I think a, a key question here is, what kind of growth are we talking about? And there is this discussion going on. Uh, Jürgen Randers is, is visiting Bergen these days at the, the Climate Festival. Uh, he's one of the, the fathers of the, the concept of green growth, this idea that there are types of growth that are more sustainable than others. So simply put, if the yoga economy grows, that doesn't have as much of a footprint as if the coal economy grows, right? A simple and some straw man example. Uh, but it is, of course, true that some types of growth have bigger footprints than others. And there this, there's this super interesting discussion. And for those of you who are on Twitter, you can follow it on Twitter, for instance, between people who believe in green growth and those who don't. There's, an, uh, there's a great beef on Twitter between... Uh, uh, a colleague of ours at MIT called Andy McAfee, who wrote a book called More From Less, which argues that we need to be smarter in our growth. We need to make more uh, from less by using less, by reusing more, by having circular models and all those kinds of things. Then there's uh, an anthropologist called Jason Hickel, who is all the time you know, arguing with, with McAfee. Uh, he wrote a book called Less Is More. So like an uh, answer to the more from less, uh, we actually need to consume less, make less, uh, you know, grow less. Uh, and this is a massive question. Is green growth pro possible? I think it is possible. I think we need to be super smart in how we think about production, consumption, not at least reuse. Uh, I think that that can be done within the capitalist system, but I think like Sweden was indicating, there needs to be a lot of brakes on that engine. We need a lot of, you know, um, political institutional level measures to ensure that the, you know, the, the, the engine of the capitalist system incentivizes those kinds of behaviors at the level of companies, at the level of households and people that are 
you know, in line with what we might think about as green growth. So another way of asking this, this question is perhaps, uh, is it possible to solve this within a democracy? <laughs> yeah, where people have the freedom of choice, because I think that's that's one of the the hallmarks of of the capitalistic system, as I just tried to d describe it uh, too shortly, of course, and it's so many more nuances that I'm able to do in a, in a few minutes. But but uh, uh, maybe it's a more of a democracy problem than an economic problem. Here we 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 have the freedom, and as human beings, we we make choices on an individual level and a on a on a collective uh, level that might not be beneficial for, for us uh, and how we divide the, the resources between us in the in the generations who lives here right now and how we deal with the with the future so so uh, does that mean that uh, the the opposite of democracy is needed in a way I, I'm, I'm not sure i'm not sure uh, but we know that as humans we make decisions and we make them short term it's easy to us to say well uh, so I heard my psychologist friend, uh, Holly Guy Shostan, said yesterday, if you're asked what do you want for dessert in two months, then you can say, well, I'll, ha I'll have fruit. <laughs> I'll have fruit in two months. But if you, if you can choose right now, you'll go for the chocolate mousse. <laughs> two of it, please. Yeah. But it's, uh, so how to make this, uh, these transitions uh, happen in uh, a free society? Yeah. Uh, that's difficult uh, task for, for all of us. And, and I think that's why it's so important that, that you have a course like this. And I think your knowledge here, not coming from a business school with your with your students, uh, you know so many other things that have to, to be fixed, <laughs> have to be understood and fixed, and how to combine that into an economy and into a democracy. Yes, we have, it's a big job to be done. And it's mm -hmm. so important that we, we talk about it, so important that we learn more about it, and that we see this problem, the complex problem, not only from one side, but from many different sides at the same time. And Hannah, I know that you have uh, one more question uh, to ask before we wrap up. Yes, I have one last question for you. Um, and that's from Anna in our course. And she asks how companies can cooperate with other companies to push governments to increase standards on sustainability. So I think that's kind of relates to this whole freedom <laughs> <laughs> but and i think it is a really good question because it, it suggests um this collaborative dimension of business that is often under communicated i think but and we see this kind of collaboration all the time and i think broadly speaking we see it in two ways uh one way we see it is when companies find it beneficial to make some sort of transition and they just want to push that uh forward. I think uh, electrical transportation is a good case here in Norway, where you've seen companies like OSCO, the logistics part of Norgas Group, which uh, is a big part of, of, of the retail um, the sector, of course. Um, they made most of their uh, most of their transportation fleet electrical. Uh, they pushed other companies in the industry to do the same. And then they went together to uh, to uh, basically lobbying to to uh, the government saying that okay now it's time to 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 make this the standard. Why should anyone not have electrical vehicles in their fleet in 2020 or 2022? Uh, so so that is sort of one of those kind of think about them as a sort of win win uh, to to use a cliche. Uh, but but where you see this kind of yeah this is, we should do this of course we should this is just better smarter than what we've been doing. Then there are cases where I think we see this in a more I don't mean defensive way, but I mean a way where companies collaborate because they need to be sure that they are not losing in the competition because they become greener. Uh, you, you have examples, I don't know these details well, but in, in fisheries, you have what is called the Marine Stewardship Council, and in forestries, you have the Forest Stewardship Council. Those are industry associations where companies come together and they make sort of a pledge or, or they agree to some standards of how they harvest trees or how they harvest fish, if that's the right verb. Uh, and, uh, and basically, they, they then say, well, these are the standards that all of us will, will follow. And it's not necessarily individually beneficial for one single company to do it. But if everyone agrees to it, then OK, then that's the standard for everyone and, and we can compete within that. So we, all, we also see those examples where... Uh, they don't even need to push the government because they are basically saying we we can organize this on our own side. You know, we don't need the company, the, the government, to regulate us. We can agree on a level of harvesting that perhaps is what the regulator would have told us anyway. 
So, so I think that is another kind of more, again, I won't call it defensive because it's not really defensive. It's, it's just, you know, a clever way of organizing an industry where people say, well, these are the rules that we will play by. So I think those are at least two examples of what Anna is asking. And the bigger picture here, collaboration uh, between companies, between customers and companies, between uh, governments and companies, non-government organizations uh, and companies. Uh, the need here to, 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 to find new kinds of, of partnerships is, uh, is so important. And, and to see uh, how, to, how to design the symbiosis between companies so uh, a resource never becomes waste. It only becomes a resource for, for other companies and how to, to think in smart, smarter ways in these ecosystems of, of, of business models and other organizational models is, uh, is very important too. Ingeborg Grunning and Hanna Johansson, thank you so much for joining Adventures in Sustainable Business. Thank you for bringing these uh, challenging but very important and interesting questions and for engaging in conversations uh, with us. Uh, give our very best to your students and best of luck with uh, completing your course in sustainable innovation at the University of Bergen. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for having us. You have listened to Adventures in Sustainable Business with Jurgensen and Peterson. Visit us at jurgensenpetersen.no okay. where you can find more information about this podcast and other information about our work. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review.